Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Kelly Fukai. I am the Regional Government Affairs Manager for Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories out here in the Spokane Valley. I see some of my friends there. Um, and I am also the Chair of the Greater Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce Government Action Committee. So again, thank you all for coming tonight to our 4th District Legislative Forum. We appreciate you having he you here. Um, the way the program will run tonight is we'll hear from both um, our position one and position two candidates tonight, we have Representative Matt Shea and Ted Cummings here. And then we have Representative Bob McCaslin and Mary May that will be up second. Uh, hosting and um, facilitating the question portion of the um, forum will be Mike Cathcart, who is the director of uh, Better Spokane, which is an organization that strives to help the Inland Northwest reach its economic potential and supports a strong pro-business community in our area. And we appreciate um, Mike and all the work he's done with us um, at the Spokane Valley Chamber, and we are very grateful that he was willing to facilitate this tonight. So um, once again, thank you for coming, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Well, thank you, everybody. So we're going to get right into this thing here. Let me first uh, start by just kind of going over the rules uh, that were laid out. Uh, rules here. So each candidate will have 90 seconds to introduce themselves. Uh, each uh, response will be 60 seconds, and each rebuttal will be 30 seconds if they choose to take it. Um, and we hope to reserve a few minutes at the end for uh, questions from the audience, and so I hope that you guys filled out the little note cards when you came in. That's how those questions are going to be asked, and they'll be brought up to you. Um, did, oh, right, there we go. Uh, and then, uh, as a closing statement, every candidate will get, or each candidate will get 90 seconds. Uh, and then I would like to ask, as we start, uh, if our position two candidates could actually excuse themselves, because some of these questions are an overlap, and I think it's just fair that they have an opportunity to uh, hear them for the first time when it's their turn. Thanks, Bob. And you, you guys are welcome to stand or sit, whatever you guys would like to do. Oh, sure. I, I just think out of fairness, it's, it's... Okay. all right. Well, are, do you guys prefer to stand or would you like to sit? I think to do the introductions, we'll stand. All right. So we each, each of you guys will get 90 seconds then to introduce yourselves. Uh, Kieran is going to be our timekeeper. He will show a yellow card when half of your time has expired and the red card when your time has, in fact, expired. Uh, we're going to start from the right to the left going this way. Um, and so we'll start with uh, Representative Matt Shea. And, and Representative, in your response, if you could also address whether or not um, you will be, uh, one of your priorities will be to advocate for better business policies in the greater Spokane Valley region. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, thank you everybody for being here this evening. And uh, it appears like this is, there we go. Thank you everybody for being here this evening. I'm just going to talk in the this. All right. Thank you everybody for being here this evening. My name is Matt Shea. I'm state representative for the fourth district right now. Uh, I really appreciate the Spokane Valley for several reasons. Yeah. One of them is that we really believe in lower taxes, less government, and more freedom. These are things that I have stood for. My family is four generations in eastern Washington. We help pioneer eastern Washington. My wife is a legal immigrant from the Ukraine because she wanted to come here to Spokane Valley because of freedom. My family also is very, very tied to the business community. My uncle owns one of the largest manufacturing facilities in Spokane Valley. And I believe too that my record speaks volumes. My record of having the most successful slate of conservative bills in the history of the state of Washington and also building coalitions around issues of principle. Three things that you can remember about me. Number one, when I go to Olympia, I'll do what I say I'm gonna do. Number two, I will follow the Constitution. And number three, I will get government out of the way of small business and make it protect the lives, liberty, property, and ability to defend the same for all citizens in Spokane Valley. VoteShea.com is my website. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. Cummings, your turn. 
Good evening, thank you for letting me address you tonight. My name is Ted Cummings. I'm a lifelong resident of Spokane, the Spokane area. I am a small business owner. I raise Angus cows, hay, and timber up in Chatteroy. I have worked for small business owners, and currently I'm employed at Kaiser Aluminum where I've worked for the last 30 years. Uh, my experience in, uh, excuse me, I also married to a wonderful woman. I've been married to her for 37 years and uh, two grown sons, uh, Robert and Nicholas. Uh, my experience in business has given me a real understanding of the challenges we face. I've been on both sides. I've been in management and I've been an hourly guy on the floor. I work for a large corporation and a small business. And I think I understand the challenges and the frustrations that business faces. There's, there's nothing worse than getting your product to market and then having to turn around and write a check to government when you're not really sure if, you're, if your funds are being spent well. And that's why it's so important to send the right people to Olympia, people who are focused on your needs. Business drives our community, right? We, we can't have a vibrant, healthy community without you and, and the work and, and you, uh, the employees that you uh, give a check to and benefits to, and I understand that. At the same time, we have to focus on, on what your tax dollars do. They build our roads, and they give us services, and they drive education. That education is building our future. And so I hope tonight we can get into the, the real need of why we're all here, and it's, a, it's about building a better community and a better Washington. Thank you very much. And um, one thing I forgot to mention, and I think it kind of goes without saying, is just please be respectful. This goes to the candidates as well as the audience. Uh, need any outbursts or, or any outlandish responses from anybody and I think we'll all have a really good night. Uh, so our questions kind of run the gamut of some different issues but they're all somewhat business or education related. Uh, they make sense uh, for why we're here this evening with the Spokane Valley Chamber. Uh, so the next question I want to ask is actually more related to, to the environment uh, and this question is what legislative solutions would you pursue in the 2019 legislative session to specifically address forest fires and the impacts they have on outdoor recreation, health, and tourism in the greater Spokane Valley area and Washington State? And this question starts with Mr. Cummings. Thank you. It's a, a really timely uh, question. And we see every year our, our uh, fires and smoke and you hear about the quality of life. and. And that's a, our big draw here, is, is the quality of life. So we have a lot of challenges. We have an initiative 1631 that's coming up, uh, the carbon initiative, and it's, and it's controversial, and I get it. But I, I wanna say this, what, what do we have to lose by trying to be more efficient and trying new things? There, there's a saying, uh, uh, if you, what do you get if you do nothing, and it's nothing. And, and that's exactly right. 1631 isn't perfect, and it's expensive, and it could be a big disaster. But I don't think we have a choice. I think the, the time is now to act. And, and that's based on science. It's not based on gut feelings or what your dad said or, or an ache in your knee. It's based on science. So let's, let's embrace the future. And, and this is coming from a steel worker, a guy who works in heavy industry. We sat down with environmentalists and lots of groups to craft something. It's not perfect but it's, it's a step in the right direction. And I, and I think we have to get past our fears and move forward. Thank you, Representative Shea. All right, we'll try this. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try it again. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me in the back, and if you can, I'll speak even louder. 94 million tons of CO2 is emitted in Washington State per year. Almost a third of that is from catastrophic wildfires. The single solution is not raising taxes in some carbon tax scheme. It's very simple. It's manage our forests better. It's to get our roads into the backcountry so that our wildfire firefighting teams can get there and put the fire outs in time before they become catastrophic. It is selective logging, and it is also something that I have introduced, and that is incentivizing biochar. Biochar can be used from charred trees for everything from soil remediation in our agricultural areas, uh, it can be used to increase crop yields. Those are the things that are true solutions for Washington State, and we don't need to do any of it without raising taxes, because raising taxes is just going to harm our business community. Mr. Cummings, would you like to use your rebuttal? Well, uh, yeah, raising taxes seems counterintuitive, but here's the thing. If we 
we don't do something, we're not going to have to worry about selective harvesting because we're not going to have forests. The fires are going to get worse. And absolutely, we need to manage our forests. But that tax dollar is going to drive innovation and it's going to push us into cleaner energies and cleaner uh, methods of doing business. It's essential to raise that money to get ahead of this and to proactively address this problem and not sit back and rely on the same tired methods that we've always had. Times are changing and we have to keep up. This initiative is a good step in the right direction. Representative Shea, would you like to use your? Uh, yes. So we haven't even done forest management. That's the point. There's no tired status quo. We aren't managing our forests right now. I come from a logging family, and if we simply did normal, healthy logging practices, we wouldn't have those catastrophic wildfires. Every expert in the logging industry understands that reducing the fuel load is absolutely critical, and reducing that fuel load is also going to create jobs and re-incentivize people all over eastern Washington to restart their mills, especially in our rural communities, which is going to mean hundreds of jobs. This next question will begin with Representative Shea. Uh, two years ago, the legislature for the first time in history reduced tuition at state universities and community colleges. Will you work to further make tuition more accessible? Are there reforms that could reduce the overall cost of providing higher education in our state? Yes, and we actually have worked to do that quite frequently. I think that one of the key things we need to do is understand that not everybody needs a four-year education. If we actually go into the community college structure, we also go into the STEM structure like we've done in Spokane Valley, uh, and, and make it so that our young people can learn trades instead of having to go to four years of college, that's going to cut costs right there, number one. Number two, it's going to make us more competitive on the world stage. Mr. Cummings. This will be the only time I say this tonight, but I agree with you, Matt. We need to get more trade schools and, and uh, get our kids working with their hands and get the skilled trades going. Um, I'm all for about uh, apprenticeship programs and, and getting people engaged in that. But I also think we need to look at tuition and, and the amount of uh, interest that's charged on tuition. I'm not an expert on this, and, and I need to learn a lot more about it, but it seems unconscionable to me to make money on young people who are trying to better themselves and trying to, to learn skills that's going to pay off for us in the future. That, that's something that we can work together and collaboratively say, no, this is something that we believe in, we're going to invest in, and we're going to get people in school. And if it's a trade school or, or a craft uh, program, that's great. Whatever that child or that young person wants to do, we need to funnel into that, but we shouldn't look at them as a way to make money. We need to reduce overhead in, in schools and, and really tackle this problem. Thank you. Would you like to use your next 30? Uh, yeah. Valley Tech is probably one of the great success stories in the state of Washington. I worked very closely with Central Valley School District, among many, many others, to make that happen and also to make sure the state funding didn't just stay on the west side of the state, it actually came to Spokane Valley as well to help make what I'm talking about, that actual technical school, a reality for our young people into the future. Mr. Cummings? All right, we'll move on to our next question. Start with uh, Mr. Cummings. Um, as the affordable housing crisis continues to plague our community, what can the legislature do to address this issue? Should reforms be considered to the Growth Management Act or the Condo Act? Are there other policy or funding considerations that should be examined? I hope you guys can hear me. I'm just going to speak up. Uh, affordable housing is a huge crisis, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, we have a, a, a wave of people coming at us from both sides. We have young people who can't get into housing. We have older people who are being forced out of their housing. So absolutely, we need reforms every way around that. And if that means that we have to have the state work with a private businesses and private developers are all in favor of that. Uh, we, and we need to start on it now. So I, I'm for zoning and that makes sense. We don't want to have urban sprawl, but it's something that business and government are going to have to work together to tackle because this problem isn't going away. And you can see it, the homeless people under, under our freeways and it's, it's a shame. We're better than this. We can spend money on a lot of different areas. Well, housing and health care are two areas that we cannot go uh, ignore any longer, and we really need to get serious about this. Is that 
So there are two things uh, that I think are absolutely core to this happening. One of them is incentivizing the faith community to help out with the homeless crisis that we do have. Number two, we need to repeal the Growth Management Act. Short of that, there are many reforms we could do to the Growth Management Act that are going to allow the development of single family structures. And particularly, the urban growth boundaries that we have right now in this one size fits all has not just affected single family dwellings and the homeless housing issue that we have, it's also affected our ability to build schools in those areas as well. So I'm not sure what you meant by the, the, the faith communities, but I've heard that some people think that homelessness is a choice, and it's absolutely not a choice. All right, no one, uh, very few people choose to be homeless. So we need to, to work together as, as a cohesive problem. There is a lot of factors here. There's the economic interest. We need to get jobs in here that can afford homes. We need to get more housing on the market. And then we need to treat the mental health issues, the opioid crisis that we have going on. And we need to attack this from many, many fronts. You know, I would add too that uh, keeping the Hearst decision, which we helped to fix in the legislature, keeping that fix in place is going to help this issue of building single family dwellings across Washington State. The, the two are not separate. But speaking about the faith community, Programs like Union Gospel Mission that have been very successful at reintegrating people and keeping them off the streets, those are the kind of faith programs that I think we need to incentivize. Thank you. Our next question. Uh, in 2017, Governor Inslee vetoed bipartisan legislation that would have lowered B&O tax rates for manufacturers. In your opinion, should the legislature continue working towards tax relief for manufacturers in Washington State? And we'll be here for that Absolutely. In fact, uh, it was unconscionable that we did not make the tax structure even across the board for all of our businesses. It was interesting, a couple of years before that, the Boeing tax breaks, everybody was talking about how this was going to spur business, spur jobs. Well, if it's good enough for Boeing, I think it's good enough for all businesses in Washington State, and we need to make sure that that happens. One of the competitive disadvantages we have with the state of Idaho is the way that our B&O tax is handled, specifically that it is not on the net, it is on the gross, and a lot of startup businesses need to have that incentive when they start up so that they can survive instead of during those precious couple of years when they're getting their, their feet on the ground that they actually go under because of the way things are in Washington State right now. And I will talk a little bit later, I hope, on regulations. So, it's something when I'm out knocking doors that comes up time and time again, especially from small business owners, that the B&O tax is killing them and that it's unfair. And, and that's the beauty of, of our country. When something's wrong, we go to our representatives to fix it. The fact that it's gone on this long, broken, and has that much anger and resentment out there is a big red flag. We, we can fix this, but we need representatives to go to Olympia that are focused on this kind of problem. And, and we need to look at a lot of different solutions out there, but we can only do that when we're focused on the interests of the four, right? And not on some other personal agenda. I don't think we have that one. I think, so for instance, I just sold some timber, and I got a letter from the state of Washington asking for me to pay a tax on it. And they sent me a letter that I can uh, take a class to learn to fill out the form. That kind of stuff is ridiculous. And, it, and it's one of the reasons that drives the resentment of our, of our citizens and our business owners. Well, being a member of House Republican leadership, we have worked on this issue several different ways on amendments and also co-sponsoring bills that are going to lower this. In fact, when Boeing was getting that tax break, I, along with several other colleagues, wanted to make that tax break across the board for all businesses. And that is thinking of all of Washington State at the same time of thinking about Spokane Valley. And it's also one of the reasons our work on this is spurring growth in Spokane Valley uh, and the greater Spokane area, specifically on the West Plains as well. Well, I, I would agree. I mean, if, if you've been working on it a long time, and it's something that finally needs to get done. But we need to have a cohesive set of representatives in Olympia. We all have to be on the same page. And, and going in the same direction. Um, that's the only way that we're going to be able to, ad to address this problem and reduce taxes. So. Thank you, guys. Uh, this next question, what should Washington State be doing to address the growing opioid crisis? 
and we'll start with Mr. Cummings. Uh, good question, and it's a, something that I'm going to have to reach out to healthcare providers, law enforcement, uh, places like Union Gospel Mission, uh, the faith community, and, and everyone. We're going to have to get everybody's input on this. And again, it's a complex uh, uh, situation, but I think ultimately this was a uh, a manufactured crisis. I think we had a, a company out there that acted irresponsibly and forced these pills out on the people and, and called it a panacea. I don't think the red flags were ignored and it was all chasing a dollar. And I think that's unconscionable. I think two things. One, we need to force existing laws. We also need to empower our law enforcement locally to crack down on this. But secondly, it's very simple from the healthcare provider standpoint. They know right now that you have to treat <coughs> drug addiction and mental health almost always in the same person. It's almost always tied together. And until we actually allow our behavioral health folks to do that treatment together, especially in some of the great facilities we have out here like American Behavioral Health, we're not going to end that crisis. Well, I completely disagree with that statement. This has nothing to do with law enforcement. Locking people up for a disease isn't going to help anyone. If you want less taxes, locking people up and punishing people for their problems is the absolute wrong way to go. We need to look at behavioral programs for sure. That starts with education, and it starts with nutritional programs. It starts with caring for families young and intervening early. Then we need to have diversion programs. We need to keep these people out of prison, out of jail. And that's just going to cause a, a snowballing problem. We have whole kids growing up without moms and dads, but we haven't addressed this issue. Speaking with dozens of doctors and first responders, it absolutely is a law enforcement issue because you have, you have bad actors out there that have been over-prescribing. Everybody knows who those people are, and they're not being held accountable. And law enforcement wants to hold them accountable. Let's help them do it. Thank you both. Uh, we'll stick with the healthcare theme. Um, and this question, uh, we'll start with Representative Shane. An initiative failed to make the ballot this year, but will likely return next year, which would create a universal healthcare program in Washington State. Is this a concept you support? And if so, how do you propose the state paper? Universal health care is absolutely a failure. It has been always, and I actually when I talked to my wife about being under universal health care in the Ukraine in the former Soviet Union, she was pretty clear about it. it. It makes not just everybody poor, but it also makes everybody have the lowest level of treatment. What we need to do is actually go back to the private sector. We need to allow portability for our health insurance. We need to allow catastrophic plans for some of our younger folks. And we need to get out of the doctor-patient relationship and allow that decision to determine determined at the lowest level so that we don't have some board of all wise people interjecting themselves in, into that decision making. It is, it is not working here in Washington State. There are so many other states out there that have gone to a cash model like Oklahoma. We know the solutions. We just need to help, help make them happen in Washington State. Thank you. So I don't know if you want to call it universal health care, but I believe in health care for everyone. Every person in this country deserves health care. So we can be smart about it, or we can continue down this road that we're doing where we can't sustain what we have. And nobody is satisfied with it. You know, Henry J. Kaiser recognized health care 70 years ago, built a hospital for his employees and his community. We can partner with private uh, providers and a government provider and work craft something. Just like we have the post office, we have UPS. So we have to stop uh, dancing around this. This isn't something that we can just put back on, on our citizens, right? Our wages aren't keeping up with health care. And it's wrong to give someone a deductible that's so high that health care is virtually unusable and worthless, right? So let's get over the fact that uh, it sounds like a socialist plot and, and do something good for one another and your neighbors. There isn't anyone here that faced with a neighbor that has a health care would deny them that. Well, it is socialism because that's what the proponents have admitted. Number one. Number two, it's very interesting when you talk to business owners and their premiums are doubling and tripling. How are you going to stay in business to provide that ability for your employees, you're not, it's not possible. And I have talked again to dozens of people that have talked about that 
You can't have a monopoly and think it's going to be efficient. Three healthcare insurance companies in Washington State, and that's it, has not allowed competition and has not driven down the cost. It's actually done the exact opposite, and we need to flip that around. So we, we do need more innovation. Three providers isn't enough. But we do need a fail-safe for these people, and that's what I'm talking about. Everyone needs that, whether you expand Medicare or Medicaid, and, and give everyone that option. If you want to pay for your health care, that's terrific. If you have a private provider and you can afford it, that's terrific. But right now, everyone's running into the ER room, and that's expensive. And it doesn't make any sense. And it, it, if you're talking about business, and this is a, a room full of business leaders, then let's get together. And let's craft a, 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 a co-op or whatever you will. We can figure this out. We'll have to get through this rhetoric and fear of socialism and take care of one another. So we have two more prepared questions, and then I do have a couple questions that we will move to from the audience. Um, recently, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that public sector employees cannot be compelled to join the union and must have the freedom to choose. Do you believe there is anything the legislature should do to further address worker rights or human rights in our state? So, I'm a steel worker, I'm a union representative, and I completely uh, disagree with right to work and, and the jazz decision and all that. So I, I think that's a race to the bottom. If you want to see how uh, that works, just go next door to Idaho. And you can watch all those people from Idaho stream across to take Washington jobs, good paying Washington jobs. They don't leave anything behind. So we need to strengthen people's ability to negotiate and bargain for a contract. Now, if you're a small business owner, that doesn't sound too great. But you probably aren't impacted by this. This is for the large corporations, the large businesses, the state. Uh, this, is, this is the balancing act that we have. We have a, a justice system with a prosecutor and a defense attorney. Labor's no different. They're there to advocate. The, the Congress, the Chamber of Commerce is no different than a union. You come together and you act as one for the best interests of the group. And that's what we're talking about here, and I completely support strengthening the work of them. I think the Janus decision vindicated my bill on right to work, particularly regarding public sector unions and the fact it's unconstitutional to force somebody to belong to an organization that they don't want to. To say otherwise, quite candidly, is un-American. We need to allow people the right to choose an organization that is going to benefit them, and if they don't think it's benefiting them, not to pay into it and not to be a part of it. I do want to say very clearly, though, we're talking about public sector unions right now. And many of us, my seatmate included, have worked very closely with private sector unions on a bunch of different reforms. So there's nothing more American than a union. The United States of America is a union for crying out loud. If you don't want to belong to a union, don't. There's methods to go about it. You organize a desert vote and kick the union out. Or you run for office and you change that union and make it responsive to you and run it the way you think it should be run. This is, this is about a, an abuse of power. It, it, you need to have employees have a voice in there. And that's what it does. I get so angry when people vilify something that's so fundamental and so basic for people to come together, the weak to say, hey, would you speak for me? I'm so doggone proud to speak for my brothers and sisters at that local, I can't even tell you. The problem is that public sector unions weren't speaking for the people, and that's why there was such an outcry. In fact, millions of dollars was going to one political party and a very small fraction to another, and that was not representative of the union constituency. Again, it's really simple in America. You can choose to belong to something. You can choose not to belong to something. And that is what the United States Supreme Court said. And also, it's going to be better for efficiency in government as well. This question will start with Representative Shea. In the last year, Spokane Valley was awarded the Titan Grant and now funds the Barker BNSF Great Separation. In your opinion, should the Bridging the Valley Project be our region's top infrastructure priority? And if so, what will you do in the legislature, in the next legislature, to secure additional funding to allow us to take the next steps in Bridging the Valley? Well, we've been working actually together, our working group on this, to make this a reality. I want to have a caveat there. Anything that we do that's going to impact business, business needs to be at the table. And talking to a couple of business owners is not uh, sufficient. We need to have a robust discussion with business that's going to be impacted and involved in these, in these uh, types of projects. I'm already working on trying to secure funding to complete the Bridging the Valley project. It looks like we have Pines already ready to go. 
we have the separation of Barker ready to go, and also it's something that's le less talked about, the interchange, the freeway interchange of Barker Road and Harvard, which it looks like are funded too, and then expanding I-90, the Idaho border, which is a much needed project. We have lots of businesses and lots of jobs coming into Spokane Valley. We need to have the infrastructure to support it, and the current legislative team has worked very diligently to make that happen, myself included. So I, I haven't been in the room and involved in this, uh, but from what I understand that this was a decided project, and yes, I believe it should be at, at the very top of the list. And, and then Mr. Shea at the last minute uh, introduced an amendment that almost derailed it and stopped funding for that. And to me, that, that's, I don't know what the motivation was there, but I think we should all be connected in and have a cohesive group going forward and not be blindsided by someone deciding, I'm gonna go rogue and go this direction. So infrastructure is key to everything that we do right now. It's going to set us up to be successful in the future. In the valley right now, the, the freeway turns into a parking lot around 3 o'clock. And, and these train crossings are horrible. <coughs> if you've ever been stuck behind one, we have a project now that we can fix a lot of this. And we need to have more of them. And that's going to drive jobs. It's going to drive customers to your business. These are good things. We need a representative that's going to work with that to get these projects going, not throw wild blocks and stop them. It's an interesting characterization considering the fact that it was our delegation that helped secure the funding to make this happen, number one. Number two, the reason that that amendment, which you can't hang by yourself, you have to have a group of people that do that, was put in place is because the business community out in the industrial park hadn't been consulted except for three businesses. And that was important to all of us that the whole business community be heard on these projects since it was going to affect them greatly and we're bringing in a lot of other businesses into the industrial park. That just simply makes sense. We need to have a dialogue. You can't ice people out and say that they have a view when they weren't at the table. I don't know how someone was left out that long into a project where it's almost ready to, to turn dirt and then you find a, a party that didn't know anything about it. I find that uh, difficult to believe. Okay, we are going to move into the audience questions, and these are, um, I just have three in these are kind of unique, so I'm going to go with it. Um, what role, if any, should Washington State play, or, uh, well, what role, uh, if any, should Washington State play to address the current immigration crisis? Is there a role for the state? And we'll start with Mr. Price. So, uh, the immigration crisis right now really isn't on our border, but it affects us all. We're all Americans. And when I turn on the TV and I see the way these people are portrayed, uh, it embarrasses me and it disheartens me. I, I get, I, talk, I work in a, in a big factory and I bet half the people there uh, disagree with me and agree with my president and the way he's treated me. But this isn't about uh, what's popular. This is about what's right. right. These are human beings coming this way and they're being portrayed as criminals and it is, it is the most base and vile thing that I've ever seen, and frankly, uh, uh, it's a sad time in our history. We need to vet these people, we need to treat these people with respect. Everyone that comes to our border needs to be treated and listened to and understood. We're, we're basically a nation, except for our native population, of immigrants. My mother immigrated from Sweden, and because a person's color, their skin color is different than ours, we're going to vilify them, that's shameful. So I get it's a financial thing, but we need to treat these people as human beings. Well, I wholeheartedly support our president's stance on immigration and his policies that he's put forward, number one. Number two, I'm going to say as a person whose wife and many family members have immigrated here legally after waiting three years in line, some of whom had to endure severe hardship just to get in this country because they understood this country is based on the rule of law. And the rule of law starts at our borders and it should be respected. When it's not respected, then everything else will start crumbling. And I would also mention too that I helped an individual from Iraq immigrate to this country with his family and his family got the medical treatment that they needed and deserved, but they waited in line as well. In fact, he endured a car bombing before he could get in this country and he had to wait five years to get here. That is what America is about, is getting folks here legally who love freedom and I think we should all support that. I, I'm all for a rule of law, 
But then I think Matt would feel quite differently if his wife was in danger and someone had a gun at her head and she was in fear for her life and her children's life every single day. And that's what we have going on here right now. This isn't something they want to do. This is something they're being forced on to do. And this is something that we play a role in. We have countries just to the south of us. And if, if you don't want to spend money on, on all this ice and all this stuff, let's go down there and help stabilize those countries. Let's stop talking about this is America, do it legally, when, when we're, we're blind to the need going on right now. Well, Waleed Khalid, my good friend, was facing quite literally guns and car bombings in Syria because he had to leave Iraq and go there so he could finally come to the United States of America. Ultimately, if we're a rule of law, we're a rule of law nation. We're going to respect that. And I would just, I would end with this, that all the folks that have come here legally are very upset at the folks that are trying to cut in line. And nobody is forcing anybody to walk from Honduras, break through gates and barriers to come to this country. They're doing it of their own volition. Our next audience question, and this is uh, specifically regarding the proposed sale of Avista to Hydro One. Uh, First, is this sale in the best interest of the public? And two, uh, this is kind of complicated, but I'll put it out there. Do you believe the state and federal government are required to coordinate the sale with local governments? And we'll start with Governor Shea. Thank you. Uh, to the extent you're referring to coordination as it exists in current uh, U.S. code, the answer is obviously yes, we have to abide by the code. You're talking about the sale of Avista and Hydro One. That's why we have the Utilities and Transportation Commission. It's the whole reason we have the UTC is to approve these kind of things and vet these kind of things. There are some legitimate concerns about a foreign country having a significant ownership stake in current U.S. infrastructure. But I know that the UTC is looking at that, and I know some citizens have voiced their uh, extreme opposition to it, and they've raised some pretty good points that that could result in some significant rate hikes. That said, the UTC would have to approve all of those rate hikes as well. So I think we have the existing check and balance that's in the system that should be in the system. I think we need to let the system work the way it's supposed to. Mr. Collins? So I, I don't know all the ins and outs of this. I attended one UTC meeting. Um, but I do know this. I, in the 1980s, I worked at a smelter north of town. And we got our electricity from Bonneville, right? And that's why that smelter was there. And it supported thousands of family jobs. And a, a company called Enron came along, and they gained our electricity uh, system. They drove prices up artificially. So I, I'm not in favor of, of any company, or let alone a foreign country, owning a public utility. That dam and that facility and, and all that infrastructure is to serve us here in eastern Washington in the Pacific Northwest and I believe the management of that and the upkeep of that should remain in, in local control. One of the things that was very interesting is after there was an election up in Canada there was a fairly dramatic change of the board up there and that again underscored these concerns of folks here locally about the Vista but Everybody seems to keep missing the fact that the UTC exists to be a check on any abuse in that system, and also it didn't change the governing structure of Avista itself. I think that's a very important point that needs to be out there for everyone. All right. Uh, this is our last question from the audience before we move into closing statements. Uh, it's a little lighter, so thank you to whoever wrote this question. Uh, what are you most proud of in your life? We'll start with Mr. Collins. How much time do I have? I'll take a second. <laughs> I'm uh, 57 years old and I've, uh, I've had an amazing life. And I, I, I think I'm most proud of that, that I've, I've, I've arrived here. I'm doing something that uh, I believe in with all my heart. I've been given everything by this country. Well, I haven't been given anything. I was given the opportunity to be where I am here tonight. I've always had a job that paid a living wage, or my parents have. I've always had health care a roof over my head, enough to eat, medical care, and dental. I've had everything that a human being, no one has lived as well as I have. And I see that slipping away from us. And I see especially now our country divided and all this uh, fear 
basically, and fear mongering amongst our public officials and even <coughs> one another. We've lost trust in one another. Well, I'm proud that I can stand up here and say, I've lived a life that you can believe in. Come and talk to me. Look at what I've done. And, and I think just being here, standing in front of you today and offering to serve you is something I'm most proud of. I am most proud of giving my life to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and also to marrying my lovely and wonderful bride, Victoria, uh, who has been uh, a light not just to me, but many of the folks that I know in our, our family circle and in the community. I assume no rebuttal on this. Let's <laughs> <laughs> uh, move into closing uh, statements, 90 seconds each. Uh, and I know we, we began with Representative Shea, and the, the final closing is the more coveted, so we'll, we will start with Representative Shea. Well, first of all, it's been an honor to serve you as 4th District State Representative. This race is pretty simple. There's a severe and stark contrast. If you want somebody that is pro-life, I'm your guy. If you want somebody that is NRA, A-plus rated, that's going to defend your right to bear arms, I'm your guy. If you want somebody that's going to defend religious liberty and the right of conscience, I'm your guy. If there's any question about our Christian heritage or removing God from our national anthem and from our monuments, like my opponent suggests, I'm not going to let that happen, and I'm your guy. If you believe in the right of property and water rights and you want that protected, I'm your guy. If you believe that our Constitution matters and that we should get government out of the way of our small businesses and reduce regulations here in the state of Washington like has happened so successfully at the national level, then I'm your guy. That's the choice that you have before you. Lower taxes, less government, and more freedom. The idea, the idea that all of us together as a community can work together to make that happen so that our kids and our grandkids can live with that peace and prosperity and freedom. As a veteran who's had over 100 hours of counter-terror training, we need to acknowledge the threats that are out there too, but we need to unite as Americans and stop the divisive rhetoric that's out there. Vocea.com, thank you. Thank you. So in manufacturing, we use something called lean manufacturing, and that says that all decisions should be made by those closest to the problem. Well, in commerce, that would be bodies like this. And I want to come and work with you about your struggles with taxes and regulations and take that back to Olympia and work with the body of legislators there to solve your problems. Right? If, we're, if we don't have that, we're not going to ever get there. I believe the incumbent is focused on the stuff that he just talked about right now. And that isn't going to make your lives better, that's going to make them worse. He's not going to be able to be work collaboratively or cohesively with people who do not share what I think is, is extreme views. All right? I don't see fear everywhere. I see good, hardworking people in this country and even in the people that want to come into this country. We need to come together and, and work on our infrastructure, education, housing, homelessness, and all those things. We can't be focused on a 51st state, or, or deep state conspiracy theories, or paranoia, or, or singling out which religious group is a threat, and who's deserving and who's not. That tears us apart, and that, that destroys trust in one another. It's a basic fabric of our country, is that we come together, all of us, no matter how we believe or look or love, and we work together to build a good America, a great America, and help the world. It isn't about, it isn't about our personal agendas. It's about working to have a stable government. Thank you. Can we give them both a round of applause? Please don't leave. We do have uh, another set of candidates that are going to come up here. Um, so let's uh, give them a second. A quick breather. I can't believe how great of an audience this has been. Uh, it's probably the most silent, quietest audience I've, I've ever encountered. So, this is excellent.
Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have turned in your ballots already? Okay, maybe half. And I assume the rest of you plan to vote, right? Hands up. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, just, just so you know, as folks are coming in here, uh, and you're interested in this, right now we are at uh, 30,000 ballots have been returned. If you compare that to 2016, uh, on this date, 25,000 ballots have been returned. So we are actually uh, exceeding the presidential year uh, right now at the start of this. So we're going to sit whichever side you want. Seconds, uh, 60 seconds to, to answer each question, a 30 second rebuttal, and uh, we are going to reserve some time at the end for audience questions. If you have not submitted questions yet, specifically for this race, please do so so that we have those uh, to ask them at the end. Uh, and then each candidate will get 90 seconds for their closing. And again, please be respectful. Same goes with the candidates. Uh, it was perfect in the first race, so let's just keep on going. Uh, so uh, to my right is the challenger, Mary May, and to the left is the incumbent, uh, <coughs> President Bob McCaslin. And so we're gonna start with Mary, and she is gonna give us her introduction. And in that introduction, please include um, whether or not uh, your priority is to create a, a more business-friendly climate in the British Brooklyn Valley. Wrong one. They're acting up, if you can speak up. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, good evening. Thank you for uh, having this debate and uh, having uh, giving us the opportunity to speak to more and more people. As a first time candidate, that's what I want to do and what I need to do. I am Mary May, I am running for state representative, and I want to let you know a little bit about myself. I have been a, I, I have 25 years experience in community improvement, city planning, and policy work. That prepares me well for the job of state legislator. What I have seen in the, over the past years, working for both cities, the county and most recently the state is that our area definitely needs better representation to advocate for things that we need here in the fourth legislative district. I want to work hard on things like health care, the cost of prescription drugs. I want to work hard on education and on secondary education opportunities. I do want to work hard on business. Business is what promotes and what grows our area. I want to balance the business growth with the impact that comes with that. That means about looking at infrastructure and transportation, uh, staying at the table long enough in Olympia to make sure that we get money over at our side to create um, the opportunities for business to grow. Hi, I'm Representative Bob McCaslin, State Representative here of the 4th. And my background as a school teacher for 31 years. I've seen the importance of good education for every citizen in this state, whether they go into a trade after they graduate from high school, they go on to college. It's, uh, it's important right now because we're, we've 
kind of been usually one or the other. We've been four-year degree for such a long time that we haven't allowed the possibility that kids can go from high school to a trade school or to a uh, community college and get a two-year degree to go into a trade. And those are important things. And I've been working with the home builders and, and uh, Associated Builders Contractors Group to make that happen. And so and I've got I've got some I've had some bills that de that dealt with that too, bringing professionals from the trades to be able to teach in middle school classrooms because it's too late if we don't communicate the possibilities to kids early on when they're in sixth, seventh grade, and, and that's what I plan on doing. Uh, early education is very important. Uh, we've lost 3,000 child cares in our state in the last three years, and we need to make it, we need to get to the bottom of why that's happening. I think it's it comes from the state that they've had problems. So I've got some good ideas to make that happen. Hopefully we'll talk about more. Okay. Um, the uh, first question, we'll start right here with uh, Mr. McKellen. Uh, the McClure decision is now largely considered settled, with the legislature having invested five plus billion new dollars in the case of education. Do you believe there will be a need for additional public education investments in the coming years, and what will those look like? Whatever you want. Okay, I, I'm going to say, and I think you know, K-12 education is now 52 percent of our state budget. I think we've got the funding part of it. But one of the problems is that we've, we're penalizing rural districts by who are property poor. Uh, they can't provide the same kinds of education opportunities to their kids. And it's tough to get people to want to move out to the rural area to begin with. There are, those teachers are already at the top of the salary scale. And so their money goes a little bit shorter. So I think we can find some ways to make that a little bit more equitable and continue to pay teachers well for doing a very difficult job. It's sad that it took our state seven years to fix McCleary, um, and it's good that it happened. It needs to, uh, the funding needs to continue. We need to make sure that our teachers and our schools um, continue to receive the resources that they need to take care of our kids. Education is the most one of the most important things that we can do as a state. The opportunity to provide additional funding or to find additional funding is something that I look forward to working on. Um, I agree with uh, uh, Bob McCaslin Jr. about the need to uh, promote uh, options in higher education, vocational training. Um, some of that can occur in our in our lower schools and in our public schools there too. Um, the opportunity to be creative about how we uh, teach our kids. Not all kids learn in the same way. The opportunity to look at where our kids go to school and how we utilize online training and online resources is something else that I think would be a good way to uh, wrap the whole package together. Uh, would you like to move the vote? No. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, and this will begin with uh, Ms. May. Um, and, and again, some of these are, are the same and some are different. If, if we're not asking a question that you want to hear that we asked last, please submit it uh, as one of the audience questions. Uh, recently, the City of Spokane uh, approved an aspirational goal requiring that 100% of local energy be sourced by renewables by 2030. And there's been some quiet discussion by some legislators uh, of whether or not that should be uh, adopted at the state level. Would you, would you support uh, adopting a similar goal at the state level? I would absolutely support um, adopting a similar goal at the state level. We need to move towards a green economy and um, encouraging and incentivizing that at all levels of local, state, and federal um, uh, uh, responsibilities is something that I look forward to encouraging. We cannot, change is always difficult. So how that will look and how it will transpire, I don't know. 
Um, I have some ideas about that. I know that as we move toward a green economy, we're going to have more options. And the more options we have on where we get our energy and what it costs and how we pay for it, the better we're going to be in order to, uh, to sustain our, not only our current situation, but the growth for our kids as well as our environment and what that looks like for our children as well. I, I support renewable energy when it's affordable for people. And at this point, the amount of money that we're having to give people who are running solar farms to make that affordable, I think the technology just hasn't caught up yet to be able to do that in a sustainable and inexpensive way so that people can receive you know, those benefits. So I think the, the fact that your average diesel pickup today runs cleaner than, than a gas picked up from a few years ago because of using uh, the deaf fluid. So I, I, I think it's a matter of, of technology catching up. And, but until then, we, if, if, if you want to talk about using inexpensive energy, we've got the resources to be able to do that presently. And, and that's it. <laughs> It's not always about using the least expensive alternatives. It's about creating innovation. It's about being forward thinking. It's about preparing and being on cutting edge so that not only we can uh, do better for ourselves, but that the, the world that we leave behind for our kids is better. We should not be shying away from the opportunity uh, to uh, invest in ourselves. Um, Spokane, Valley, Liberty Lake, we're full of great uh, workers and great innovators and we should not sell ourselves short. Well, and here, here's the thing. This stuff is not going to come for free. And there are people that are working in those areas already. The fact that we we've got these things available to us, people can spend more money on those things if they want to. And we can get tax credits to be able to do it. But for us to go completely in one direction without making it affordable, especially for people in the 4th District, 65% of those people are 65 and older and are on fixed incomes. We need to be thinking about them too and whether they can afford that. Next question, we'll start right here with Representative McCallum. As the affordable housing crisis continues to plague our community, what can the legislature do to address this? Uh, should reforms be considered to the Growth Management Act or the Condo Act? Are there other policy or funding considerations that should be examined? Well, there's been talk for quite a while to allow people to have more home ownership by reforming the Condo Act. And we need to do that. There's, there's some really great propositions out there on how to do that. And I'm in favor of a lot of those. And if we can get that to happen, I think the Growth Management Act has a, has a predetermined outcome that means we're going to have to shove everybody as close together as possible and then stack them as high as we can. And I, I think people who live in a country where there should be choices and they should be affordable choices. And I, I don't want us to artificially shove people in one direction or another. So. Home is where our story begins. If you don't have a home, you are constantly thinking about where you're going to spend the night, where you are going to get your meal. The crisis that the west side of the state faces perhaps a little bit more than we do on this side for affordable housing is real. And it will get real here. And I have spoken to many young people as I've been knocking on doors that it is indeed real. I spoke, I've spoken with people that are double housed, uh, kids with their families, older adults with their um, senior citizen parents. The, again, innovation to create uh, different housing opportunities is uh, something that I would love to work on. The, um, uh, 
the GMA reforms and the Condo Act reform definitely that there are barriers being put in or if barriers exist because of legislation that's on the books that's definitely one of the best places to start infrastructure is important when you're building homes and building communities you need to uh, have an eye out for where are the people going to work where are they going to how are they going to get there and all of that goes together with making uh, where you live affordable well, uh, affordable housing is, is definitely important. important. The, the thing is, from my experience working uh, with the Union Gospel Mission in San Jose, California for a while, and also as their chaplain at Juvenile Hall, a lot of those kids that were in Juvenile Hall were there because of homelessness, were there for, for a lot of different reasons. And to be able to work with those families the Union Gospel Mission has a great success rate with people. And I think it's because they're teaching them to help themselves. And that's what we need to do. There are so many um, organizations, entities, agencies working on the homelessness um, issue on affordable housing from so many different directions. I was at a forum earlier in the summer and got to meet a lot of those people more communication about who's doing what and how those partnerships can work together to uh, get the housing available to our um, uh, our citizens will be important. And our next question begins with uh, Ms. May. As a member of the state legislature, what would you do to address the growing opioid crisis in Washington State? The opioid crisis is not a, we should not be thinking of it as something that happens to someone else. It is happening to every single family, probably, in Washington State. I want to make sure that doctors are better trained, that they are knowledgeable about their role in the crisis. I want to make sure that our entire population is knowledgeable about how it happens. You can be pres prescribed a, a pain medicine and it's a, it can be a, um, a slippery slope. There's, in, um, I was just talking with a woman this last week who in order to get off pain meds has had this amazing surgery and so it, it, that they've been able to block the pain without using opioids and I think that that would be a wonderful thing, putting money towards medical research um, as well as uh, education. Two, two places to start anyway. I think we're making good strides in this area. I think the, the fact that there's uh, suddenly an opioid crisis uh, goes completely against everything that I know as a fact. Uh, when I started as a student at WSU, I saw that up close. Uh, kids on my dorm floor who were who were taking all different kinds of drugs. So, and I think there are tried and true ways to, to fight it too. It's just the we need to we need to have a plan one two three approach that's been proven. There are proven approaches out there that doctors use all the time. It's getting those people into those programs and making them affordable. The pharmaceutical companies for too long have been pushing the use of opioids without us asking questions why and finding alternatives. And that's another thing to, to start with. I also want to put pressure on the court system to use alternatives. Um, a drug court is an option where um, a drug abuser, and if they're not a, a, a criminal offender in any other way, they have an opportunity to, uh, to delay their sentencing so that they can treat their drug use. I would love to see that happening. I want to see um, uh, jurisdictions involved with health, mental <coughs> health, and uh, working with at-risk populations as well. There's, it's a many-faceted um, issue. I, th I think one of the, the best things we can do is, is to make sure that people know what's available to them and also 
clear definition. See, I, I don't think it's the pharmacy pharmacy companies. Well, we've got so many of these opioid drugs coming from Mexico right now, and at such a cheap rate. Meth isn't a meth houses aren't a problem around here anymore because the meth coming from Mexico is so so it's inexpensive. So we're we're going to have to address that problem right here. And this uh, next question will begin with the Taslin. Uh, in 2017, Governor Inslee vetoed bipartisan <coughs> legislation that would have lowered BNO tax rates for manufacturers. Uh, in your opinion, should the legislature continue working towards tax relief for manufacturers in Washington State? Absolutely. And it's every time we've we've helped businesses by getting out of their way, and yeah, that not dealing with anything with with safety. But dealing with that business's ability to be successful. And I think a lot of times the state in a lot of different ways can get in the way of that. So I, I agree wholeheartedly that we, we can continue to do things in the, in the BNO tax is penalizing businesses in ways that they shouldn't be penalized. Should they pay taxes? Yeah. Their employees pay taxes. Every member of the company pays taxes. We don't need to add an extra tax on top of that that would hurt their ability to stay in business. A comprehensive discussion about the tax in tax structure in Washington State is well overdue. I would definitely support looking at the BNO tax that manufacturers pay and looking to see where there's inequities and what can be fixed on that. And I would like to see that be part of an entire or an overall look at our tax structure, uh, where the revenues are coming from and how they are spent. Do you have any other lights? No, I okay. said what I need to say. Next <laughs> question then. Uh, and I have one, two, I have three questions here before we move to uh, audience questions. Um, talent flight is a big problem in our region. Is there a role for the legislature to help keep young people living and working in our community? Yeah, there is a way. And it's it's by continuing to have a low cost of living to, to make home ownership a reality for people. And the best way to do that is to have qualified people with great job opportunities. And I think the Spokane, City of Spokane Valley and the City of Liberty Lake have done a great job in creating a job climate that, that makes it possible for businesses to move here and, and be able to thrive here. So I think we're going down the right road right now. And we need to continue down that road. I agree that talent flight is a problem. I have so many friends whose kids move away um, after college and uh, only sometimes come back because home, again, is where your story starts. We need to make sure that our communities are supported and that we can build the kind of communities that make our talent want to stay here. So again, fighting hard in Olympia to make sure that we're getting the resources we need to build our roads, to have um, water and wastewater uh, infrastructure, to have broadband infrastructure. We need to um, make sure that we encourage our kids with good education and sound jobs once they graduate. I think that it is a real situation and I think we have an opportunity to, uh, to have real answers for it. And I will admit, right after college, I was one of, one of those people that fled to California. There weren't any full-time teaching jobs in Spokane at the time. And so I moved to California and soon realized, after 11 years in California, Heather and I, who's in the audience right over there, we were not ever going to be able to afford a house because of, even though the wages were higher, the cost of living was so high down there. It, it didn't make sense. We moved up here. We had, uh, we were blessed to be able to own a home within the year. So I think that's a great example of how it can happen, how we can draw people back to this area because of the cost of living here is great. Thank you. Uh, this next question will start with uh, Dr. McCaslin. 
Uh, and again, if you have audience questions, uh, please submit those. Uh, in the last year, uh, Spokane Valley was awarded a Tiger Grant that now funds the Barker BNSF Great Separation. Uh, in your opinion, should the Bridging Valley projects be the top regional infrastructure priority? And if so, what will you do in the legislature to secure additional funds to allow us to take those steps in Bridging the Valley? Well, Bridging the Valley is very important. We've got a lot of projects. I spoke before the City of Liberty Lakes City Council uh, just last week about that. And, and what I urge them to do is to work together with the City of Spokane Valley. I think they have all of those different projects interconnect. It's all dealing with transportation. They can work together to prioritize what they, what they want. And we in Olympia, representing them, can go before our people in the transportation department and say, look how important these things are. We are growing so fast. We've got the new Amazon Fulfillment Center and Terra coming in. Those are great businesses. But we need the transportation to make it possible for people to get to work and to be able to get back home afterward. Okay. Transportation projects, including the Barker Road uh, project, which is part of Bridging the Valley, are crucial and critical. Um, I, uh, my husband and I have figured out the best ways to get across the railroad tracks, especially since so many more trains are coming through our way. Um, the other infrastructure, uh, other transportation improvements are necessary. In Liberty Lake, there's a need to widen the bridge that takes you from the city of Liberty Lake north. There is uh, a need for the state to look at, take a real look at Interstate 90 and add a third lane um, from Barker Road all the way to the Idaho border. So yes, bridging the valley is crucial and critical. The plans have been on the books forever. Um, and we need additional infrastructure because you cannot have economic growth if you don't have good connections and good transportation and good infrastructure. You know, we've got great opportunities here. And because the city of Spokane Valley and the city of Liberty Lake, the surrounding areas, because they use their transportation money really, really well, I think that's a, a we, we, we get our projects funded in Olympia because of that. And just more applause to, I see a couple of former uh, city council people here in the audience. And, uh, and it's because of their hard work that we're able to get those. Okay. Things like transportation projects require, as um, uh, McCaslin was saying, working at the local level, the state level, the federal level, making sure that you have the staff in place, the plans drawn up, the, uh, so that you can access the funding when it becomes available. So as a state legislator, I look forward to working on the Transportation Committee. I want to uh, be in close connection and conversation with all the uh, city councils and the um, uh, federal government as well. Um, and our regional uh, transportation planning organizations because, again, like I said, this is critical stuff. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move into the audience questions for time. Uh, we're very much over time. Uh, and so, and actually, the three questions I got are all really about one issue. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and synthesize these down. Basically, the question is, um, are you willing to, to uh, sponsor are you willing to sponsor legislation or, or vote for legislation um, that will uh, support clean energy in Washington State? And what have you done so far for the incumbent? What have you done so far to do so? But also, adding on to that, how do we protect uh, small business as we do this? Um, this is an example of the city of Ellensburg that had a wind farm that went near bankrupt um, when stimulus money ran out. So how do we finance alternative power without crypto expenditures? So, what are you willing to do to promote clean energy, to support clean energy, and how do we do it in a way that does not harm local business? And what we're trying to start with this um, As I mentioned earlier, I believe that moving towards a clean energy um, economy is, is an awesome way to spend our time, effort, our energy. Um, to protect small businesses along that route, 
I would um, like to see partnerships uh, developed between our wonderful uh, higher education institutions and our um, small businesses, um, the groups that represent them. I would love to see some entrepreneurs um, rising to the top and, and making use of all of the funding that's available. The chance to, um, I guess that, that was where I was headed, just the small businesses, yes, definitely uh, part of the legislation that everybody is will be voting on by November 5th includes some great opportunities to put investments towards that so that the cost of uh, clean energy does come down because like we've incentivized other um, areas where we've wanted our community, our, our, um, our state to move in that direction. I'll be very blunt. I, I will not support any legislation that funds or subsidizes clean energy until we get a handle on our wildfires. Now, the Los Angeles Times team came up with a, with a great article just about a year ago that, that they did the scientific studies and they said, gee, two weeks of uh, wildfires in California produce more carbon in the air than all of the cars and trucks that are on the freeway. So why would we spend money and effort trying to fund wind energy and solar energy when we're still producing all that carbon in the air from the wildfires. Sustainable forest management is what we need. And I, I know companies that would do it for free if they could keep the wood. And it's not clear cutting. It's selectively thinning out the forest and cleaning out the duff so we don't have the fires. I absolutely agree that forest management is critical and it is part of the overall picture and again when you're looking at state legislature, when you're looking at uh, where we spend our money and where we put our efforts, we need to look at how everything is interconnected. Uh, they, I, I've spoken and worked with um, a small business that indeed took the waste of the forest and the duck, collected it, processed it and made a, a a renewable resource out of that. I look forward to um, those types of innovations and continuing to work on it, but I don't think that it is wise in any way to wait to work towards clean energy until there's no more forest fires. That will just not happen. Well, and I, I still say if we don't make those efforts, and we, don't, and we have to concentrate our efforts uh, with our wildfire problems, if we don't do that, we'll con even with more clean energy, we'll still have the most and the biggest problem all across our country, our wildfires. That is what's producing the most carbon. So let's focus on that and let's get the private industry involved with that. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and ask this question just because I can. And, <laughs> and, and I think it's a nice way to end, end, uh, end our question. So uh, this will start with Representative McCaslin. What are you most proud of in your life? Well, I'm most proud of my children. And uh, my daughter, Anne, is teaching music and count, being a school counselor out in uh, on the island of Saipan. She has the travel bug, so she got a friend in college that uh, that told her about this job on the island of Saipan. And my son is uh, helping to manage a Verizon store down in Pullman, and he's making music, and that's his first love. And they're both being responsible citizens who uh, love what they do and are getting that opportunity to do it and I'm very proud of them, and, and I don't take that credit as much as Heather deserves that credit for my children. So. I am proud of, I'm most proud of my ability to rise, <laughs> to rise up under adverse circumstances, uh, professionally, personally, and just um, mentally being able to um, 
realize that we can do hard things. And then being able to pass that type of resolve on to my kids. And actually, it, it's difficult to, for me to, to say that as far as what I'm proud of. Truly, I'm just humbled by the people that I see in the audience and uh, the people that I am gifted to work with and to, um, to talk to. And if anything, I'm proud of my ability to, to, gosh, get a chance to know you, to see connections, and to um, walk this, this life with, with people. Uh, not very political there, but um, it is um, something that I'm thankful for, just being able to have the eyes that I have to see um, the, the people that I, I see. Thank you both for that. And we'll, we'll start with Ms. May for the closing statements, and each candidate will have 90 seconds. As I've been knocking on doors, um, especially in the last couple days since the ballots dropped, I have found myself saying, I know I am a Democrat running in a very conservative area. I have an uphill battle. What I like to tell them, what I want them to know, is that it is not so much about the initial after my name. It is about stepping away from the polarization that we have at the federal level, that we have at the state level. In Washington, we have the additional layer of east of the Cascades versus west of the Cascades. What I want to do as a new state legislator is leave all that behind, acknowledge that it will exist and that it may exist, but get to work on the things that matter to people. Start right away working on things that will make our lives better. Healthcare, education, protecting uh, earned benefits and so, our senior, so that we can all retire in dignity and security. There's so much work to be done and I am I'm very much looking forward to doing that, and I ask for your vote to let me get there and get to work on it. I've had the privilege of being able to do this job. I, I turned people down who wanted me to run for a long time, and, uh, and I felt it was time. Uh, my wife gave me her blessing to be able to do that and so I have the advantage of having a very supportive home life and uh, so I, I really have felt that being a former teacher and being able to be on early learning and human and human services plus the education uh, committee has enabled me to do some things that, that I've been very proud of and I been able to do some things that were, weren't really even in the realm of my thinking that I would be able to do, and that was dealing with the Hearst decision, which made it impossible for anybody to own a piece of land to have access to the water on it. And so being able to sponsor that, that uh, bill and be able to see it passed in both houses and then finally have it signed by the government was probably the biggest thing that's that, and, and it wasn't my original idea, it was Representative Dave Taylor's, and he deserves the credit for that. I had good relationships with people across the aisle. Uh, Representative Tina Orwell, Representative Eric Pettigrew, Representative Steve Berkowitz, a high school teacher from Renton. We're great friends. We talk to each other, uh, even when we're not in Olympia. And I'm very proud of my ability to work with people across the aisle. And uh, I have a great opportunity to work with Representative Shea and Senator Catton, who are wonderful people. Can we give them both a round of applause, please? guys great audience and, and thanks to the candidates for, for running and, and for serving uh, it's a really uh, difficult task but obviously a very important so thank you guys very much well and i want to thank you all for giving up your evening to come here and be with us tonight and to hear from our candidates it's important that you participate in the process um, and be involved and we thank you for that opportunity we also again thank our candidates and I would also like to thank Michael for um, helping us out and agreeing to host the um, questions. So thank you. Um, have a good evening.